so today I'm going to be testing out a lavalier microphone. A lot of people keep asking me why don't I use a lavalier microphone instead of a standard one. You know, instead of the one that like, just goes over to my mouth, and the reason is the signal-to-noise ratio. The closer the microphone is to the, your mouth, the more it will tune out crap like my hot air station, my air filter, my air conditioner, which is not even on right now, by the way. Usually I have an air conditioner on in addition to everything else. So there's a good chance that with this you won't be able to hear shit that I'm saying, but there really is only one way to find out. So, uh, today I'm going to be working on a disgusting 820-2936 motherboard. Gross, as you can see. So obviously, first thing wrong here is CPU IMVP time resistor, which we've gone over in other videos. It's gross. That section is just destroyed. So what needs to happen here is scraping away the broken section. That pad is garbage. Get to the copper trace. Once we get to the copper, we'll just solder directly to it. We need to pad. That's done. Now we take a 90, let's see, we have a 90 kilo ohm resistor over here, which we dropped in the table. We gotta put that in. This is after ultrasonic, by the way. I know it looks disgusting. I'm really curious if you can actually hear me. Like, will the signal to noise ratio be the same as it usually is, or will the lavalier microphone be? Total crap. I, I got this lavalier microphone, not for the channel by the way, I got it for covert purposes, which I'll be talking about in another video. But I needed something that could not be seen for a specific application. I actually have an interview coming up soon. And the thing with interviews is that especially for movies or television or film or documentaries is that they often, if they have a specific agenda in mind, you've got to be kidding me. And if they have a specific agenda in mind, what they, what they do is they, they, will, they will edit out all of your answers that don't fit their specific agenda, and then it makes it look like I have an opinion that I didn't have. And one of the problems that I've always had is people taking the things that I say out of context and using those out of context statements to make it sound like I've said things that I haven't said. So rather than uh, be safe than sorry, what I've done here is I got this little hidden lavalier microphone so that when I do the interview, uh, in the case that they do wind up making up a bunch of stuff or editing it so it looks like I said something that I didn't, I have my own copy of the full interview, which I can use. So that, that's where I'm going with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Because it's really annoying to be taken out of context. When people take the things you say out of context. And it's annoying dealing with manipulative people. I have no patience for manipulative people. Just none. Okay, so that is my clock chip. It's really hard getting this articulating BS to... Come on. Oh. Can't go down anymore in the current position. Okay. I get it. Clock chip. This has a lot of corrosion. See this stuff here. And you know that something bad happened to it when it looks like that. That's the other thing. I don't really have to shout when I'm doing board repair videos and I'm narrating with the other microphone, but on this one, just to get the signal to noise ratio higher, I might have to turn down the microphone preamp and then yell really loudly so that I'm louder than the noise. And that's something that may get really tiring. So here I'm just talking in my regular voice. And let's see what we get. Alrighty. Now, there is also a little bit of spill over here. Leading up to this lovely crystal. Is this still good? Is that still...
Yeesh. Up there looks really gross. Gross. Water damage is gross. This is probably going to be a waste of time since the board with quarter fan spin. There's a little piece of hair in that flux. That's not good. Everything is corroded here. Just one big pile of corroded shit. Let's see if quarter fan spin has disappeared. Wow, I'm impressed. Check it out. So what we started out with here was quarter fan spin. turn off this loud air filter. By the way, you guys may have noticed I changed my setup around here. Oh, the problem was, so I, I, this little section of the floor was elevated from the other section of the floor. So I made a little ramp, this little makeshift ramp thing, right? So that when I'm moving from one side to the other, I'm not, you know, going over a bump. And the problem is that little ram thing that we made of tile, like, it broke, and that is a hole, and my chair keeps getting stuck in the hole. So firstly, the chair was leaning like this. So I'm leaning like this, right? And my job in soldering is to do this. So what I'm doing, not only am I, it's bad enough to sit upright and do this, right? It's even worse if you're sitting upright. If you're not sitting upright, you're sitting like this, and then trying to lean over. That is just, that's just asking for scoliosis. So I'm not sure if that's the proper medical term, but I'm, but... Even though I lack the proper medical term, I'm pretty sure what I was doing was very fucking damaging to my health. So I moved the, I had two choices. Behind door number one, I could pay a proper contractor uh, three to six thousand dollars to redo the floor in my office. Behind door number two, I could pay some uh, cash off the books contractor, maybe about, you know, thousand, thirteen hundred bucks to do a shitty job redoing the entire floor in my office. And then after all that's done, get no warranty, have no ability to report them if anything is fucked up because it was an off-the-books job, and also, you know, wind up being stuck where I started. Well, behind, do behind door number three, I can literally, I can just turn it around. So now the part uh, that, that's uneven, the part that's uneven is where my computer is sitting and the speaker is sitting in. A little bit of where the table is, but the thing is the table is never straight anyway. What I care about is my chair being straight. So this makes it a lot more comfortable. And this is a really important thing to think about when you're when you're setting up a station to do work like this is that it's really, really tiring and it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of sitting in a chair. Like that's what this job is, it's sitting in a chair and figuring things out. You know, a lot of whether or not you will be able to figure out, you know, a lot of the problems that you have is are you comfortable while you're working? Because if you are not comfortable while you are working, then you may not be able to figure out a lot of the problems. You may, you may not even realize that the reason that you're not motivated to, you may think you're not motivated to because the problem is too difficult, but the real actual issue that you're going to have is that it's just too much of a, of a pain in the ass because it's, it's actually painful. And you should, you know, the whole idea with technology-based business and the whole idea behind what I'm trying to teach you guys how to do, I'm trying to teach you how to perform jobs that other people don't know how to do so that you can make money. The entire idea here is to make money. 
So, you know, you should have enough money to set yourself up with a, with a setup that feels comfortable and that is, you know, promotes good health. You know, good pot. Like, again, you know, if I'm going to sit here until 2 or 4 in the morning to figure out how to do all this stuff, then I, I should be making some money for it. If, again, if I'm going to spend, you know, hours upon hours upon hours extra every single day learning something, I should be able to make more money. And if I'm going to make more money because I sat in a chair for an extra 5 or 10 or 15 hours a week, then I should be able to use that money to, at the very least, give myself an Aeron chair instead of a folding chair so that that sitting is more comfortable. I don't know if that makes sense for you, but I know it does for me. All right, so we got keyboard, trackpad, screen, speaker, and what the hell, why not a battery? And let's see what we get here. Also a little bracket, you can stay over there, along with the magnet, and we get a charger. So first, I'm pretty sure I don't have a backlight on the screen, but let's see if I get a dong. I'll hold down the option key. Oh, we get a backlight, and we get a dong. And that's not quarter fan spin. So let's go over in the schematic what was going on here. And I hope any of this is remotely audible. It would suck if this was completely inaudible. <sighs> okay. Where is my board schematics folder? Here we go. A2029. This is actually a lucky one, because very often what's wrong here is not something that is easily fixable for me. We're just going to take Open Broadcaster and put it on the other screen here. Okay. So the first resistor that I replaced was CPU IMVP underscore TON. TON here stands for time on. Now what does time on mean? Well, this over here is a buck converter. This, uh, this chip controls this over here, which is a buck converter that creates vCore or power for the CPU. Now, the way a buck converter works is it's taking a higher voltage and switching it over to a lower voltage. So it's switching. So it's going to be, again, it's going to take your 12 or your 5 volt rail. And what the buck converter is going to do is going to tell you 12 volts, now zero. Now 12 volts, now zero. Now 12 volts, now zero. And that's going to get averaged out into something like 1 volt or 0.9 or 1.1 or whatever the hell CPU V core is on this model machine. Now, the thing is, it needs to know how much time to actually stay on for. So do I stay, you know, again, it's switching. So it's switching on, off, on, off, on, off. Should it go on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off? Or should it go on, off, on, off? Or should it go on, off, on, off? What do you think is going to have a higher voltage? On, off, on, off, or on, off, on, off? What's going to have a higher voltage if you're averaging is when it stays on more often than it's off. So. The thing is with this chip is this chip is meant to be used on many different machines that run off of many different voltages. So this chip has to create one volt for CPU vCore. It could be running off a 5 volt supply, a 12 volt supply, a 15 volt supply, an 8 volt supply. How does it know how much voltage it has to actually make? The way it's going to know how much voltage it has to make is by measuring the high side power source that it's using to create the lower voltage. And that's what the TON pin over here is for. So what this here is doing is it's a resistor between PP bus S5 high side computing, meaning high side, as in this is the uh, higher, the high voltage that we're using to create the low voltage for the computer. Though this it, which is going to sit between this and this, and it's going to set the amount of time that it spends on. So that resistor was corroded. Now let's go over the next part that I got really lucky on. <clears throat> Now this over here is the clock chip. So again, what I was doing here is I was following the path of corrosion and then trying to make logical conclusions as to what was going on. So the first thing that I had wrong was no V-core because you could see the, corro <coughs> the corrosion in that area. The second section of corrosion was the RTC circuit. Now sys this chip is responsible for creating sysclock, clock 32K, RTC. And it's also responsible for creating sysclock, clock 25M. So let's see where these go. Now, a system clock is usually going to be used for multiple components to communicate with one another. So, over here, it goes, nice try, open broadcaster, nice try. So, it goes to the PCH, so <coughs> this clock signal goes to the PCH, which is going to be used to tell the PCH when to do things. Then you also have sysclock 25M. Sysclock 25M is going to go to U3600, which is a chip for Thunderbolt. 
it's going to go to U3900, which is a chip for Ethernet. It goes to the PCH. So the whole idea behind a clock is this. Have you ever watched a political debate and you see where it kind of degenerates to the point where everybody's just screaming and yelling and you don't understand anything? Well, in the beginning, the whole idea with the political debate is I speak for a certain amount of time, then you speak for a certain amount of time, then they speak for a certain amount of time. I speak for a minute, you speak for a minute, he speaks for a minute. And the whole idea here is that if we each have an allocated time in which we can speak, we can each get our ideas across. And whether or not we agree or disagree or one of us is ridiculously right or wrong, at the very least, the audience has kind of an idea of what it is we're talking about. However, if we all yell at the same time, or there's nobody to tell, then, then nobody's going to understand what we're talking about. Further, if there is nobody to say start, then we'll never start speaking, we'll never start debating, and you won't hear anything. The same is true here. You have different chips that are talking to one another at different times in a sequence, and that is all done on a clock. If there's anything wrong with the clock circuit, you're gonna, one chip is going to go, I'm going to talk, and then the other chip is not going to talk because there's no clock, so it's going to turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. And again, I never knew off at the top of my head. I never knew. It's not like it was in, engraved in my brain. Oh, quarter fan spin is a clock issue. Oh, quarter fan spin is a current sensing issue. Oh, quarter fan spin is a BIOS issue. What I noticed is I had a quarter fan spin, and I had a big blue blob right on top of the current sensing circuit. So then when I removed it, and the quarter fan spin was gone, then I started thinking, what could quarter fan spin have to do with current sensing? Hmm, maybe the machine notices it, it, it turns on, and then it, but it tries to figure out how much current it's using after it turns on a millisecond later, and when it sees that it can't measure it or that it thinks it's using too much, it turns off. That's how I would come to that logical conclusion. So here I have a big pile of green ship on top of the clock circuit, and it's doing it turning on, turning off. So I'm thinking about what a computer clock does. You do your research on what a, how the, the clock works in the machine, what its functions are, and you realize, hmm, if there's a problem with the clock, maybe this chip goes to talk to that one, but then it can't because it just shuts off instantly. Or the clock signal is creating an irrational clock voltage. So the one clock is turning on, but the other one isn't. So it just says, hey, you know, it goes, I'm going to turn on, oh, wait. I can't, I can't hear what the other person's saying. Let me turn off. I'm going to turn on, oh, wait. The other person's not saying anything. Let me turn off. Or everybody's yelling at the same time, so you just close your ears and walk out. Uh, you know, again, you're gonna, you have to apply a little bit of logical troubleshooting to this to try to figure out why something is happening. So you see something is screwed up, and then you, you just go poking around, you just go trying to figure out what does this thing do? Why, what if I fix this little part? What happens? And you just make a little database in your head of all these different flaws. Now, the reason I say that I'm lucky here, because this, this again, this, this, it's never that easy. You, you have to realize that there are many, many times I've sat down here with quarter fan spin and it, it was some just ridiculous bullshit that I'm not going to spend six hours on. What usually happens is bad PCH, it could be bad Ethernet IC, it could be uh, that, that bad uh, chip, the small one right next to the PCH that I forget the name, <coughs> name of since I've been coughing up a storm all day. But, it's, it's usually something else. Again, I'm not saying the clock chip is good on those machines. The clock chip is often very, 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 very bad. But also, everything attached to the clock chip is also fucked. So here, I'm admitting that I got lucky. Again, it's, it's not usually that easy. It's not. It's usually something else. But here's a good example of how the clock circuit, um, you know, would have almost owned me if I didn't know to check that. So here's the thing. Now, next time I have quarter fan spin, again, this is, this is the thing that you guys should be doing. Next time that you have quarter fan spin, so I did this. The next time I have that, even if I don't have green shit on top of the clock circuit, if the board looks perfectly clean, I have something in my database. I have something in my head. If this doesn't work right, then check that. And, and that's what I want you guys to be building. So you fix that that one time because there was a little hint, and that little hint was making it obvious. Again, even after the ultrasonic. Even after the ultrasonic, that area looked like complete fucking garbage. And I mean ultrasonicing and toothbrushing. This boy looked like it was pissed on by a cat. But now it's in the database. Now I know that that's one of the things. It's in the database up here of things that could potentially cause that, so I know for next time. So you have to take this little bit of logical troubleshooting and also a general understanding of how the circuit works. So if you see that there's something wrong with that, don't just be a monkey and say, me replace this and see what happens. Also, try to figure out why. Figure out, like, Google a chip. Figure out what it does. Figure out what a clock is. Figure out what current sensing is. Really get, put some effort into trying to understand how the circuit works so that the next time something happens when there's not a hint there that's making it obvious for you, you can figure it out anyway.